Thanks, Ari. Um, is this on? Yeah? Okay. Uh, you're not going to get a polished talk uh, from me, ever. Um, uh, in fact, I'm going to be reading it. If I didn't, we'd be here for about three hours. 30, 30 minutes is like very much an artificial time frame uh, for me. I like to spread out a little bit more. Um, uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers and the, the staff of Sonic Acts. It's, uh, it's amazing, again, to be here. Um, and it's good to see a number of uh, friends and hopefully make some new ones over the uh, next couple days. Uh, I've changed my topic to uh, energies at Earth magnitude. I hadn't realized that the, the session would be called Earth magnitude. And here's, here's the book, uh, Earth Sound, Earth Signal. It came out in late 2013, so it's a little over a year old now. And uh, a lot of uh, what I say comes out of this. It took about 12 years of research. There's a lot of science uh, in it, among other things. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just launch into it. I'd like to talk about how the energies and Earth magnitude in the subtitle of my book relate to one another and to geologics and to he heliologics. First, um, magnitude. As the story goes, up to the mid 20th century, there were two distant gazes or, uh, or gazes of distance, a terrestrial lateral one bounded by horizons and an unbounded vertical one appealing to the stars. No matter how large a region one looked across, it remained chorography rather than geography. Uh, and then you always had the heavens. Uh, between those two gazes, the earth was excluded. You would have to breach a, a few horizons first. Save for the rare shadow play of a lunar eclipse, all Earth's scale was interpolation until humans rose above their lot in life with high altitude balloons, aeronautic satellites, and astronautics. These mega selfies were topped off by the indelible reverse astronomy image of the blue marble from 1972. So much ink has been spilled on the blue marble that it actually contributed to sea level rise. Here's, here's a little bit more. Uh, the energy budget of this image is probably in balance given that it has provided an obstacle uh, for prayers to radiate out into the heavens, trapping them in a realist orbit like so many greenhouse gases. However, it did so only by posturing an Olympian gaze and a hip capitalist branding of the whole earth. That's a Stuart, Stuart branding, um, and not, not Martha Stuart branding. However, um, there were massive energy requirements in setting up that photograph, even before any rocket fuel was ignited. So it is significant that the available energies were ultimately reduced and idealized through the operations of light and vision. Given a broader array of energies, a different image emerges at Earth magnitude, an earlier, more lateral and terrestrial version of live breaching horizons, not limited by light and sight, uh, that goes back to the mid-19th century, animated by the speed of the spark uh, in telegraphy. There were also signals received that no one was sending, as in 1889, with, uh, when an earthquake in Japan was registered under many horizons in Potsdam and Wilhelmshaven in teleseismometry. I'm not sure why, te why teleseismometry isn't sort of discussed in terms of telecommunications. It was used later for tanks and testing Cold War uh, underground communications, sort of this re reciprocal monitoring that was uh, long distance communication between the Soviet Union and the United States. Eh? 
The whole earth vibrating underground in 1889 occurred a dozen years before Marconi, Marconi heard his transatlantic Morse code S between Newfoundland and Cornwall, that was 1901, that itself was more likely sent uh, by an electrical storm from the Southern Hemisphere, as Hillel Schwartz summarizes in his book, Making Noise. So you couldn't call that interference, just mistaken identity. It was a report of a global radio weather. Um, the incident came from a long line of such disturbances. Um, Better back up, the, uh, a lot of the book was based upon the, the fact that Thomas Watson, uh, uh, when the telephone was first invented and the, the, the first telephone test line, a half, half mile iron line over the rooftops of Boston, at night he would listen to the telephone and hear what we call, now call uh, natural radio. And so this was radio... Uh, that was heard 20 years before Marconi. It was uh, radio was uh, was heard before it was invented. In other words, and so it sort of upsets the cart on history of uh, history and hopefully the theory of uh, uh, historical media theory as well. Um, it's because it's nature, it's nature interceding in communications where there's uh, it is pretty much been systematically excluded. Anyway, where was I? Um, the, the incident came from a long line of such disturbances. Telegraph and telephone lines were long metallic uh, con conductors that attracted the magnetic storms associated with solar winds and coronal mass ejections, that is, storms on the sun. The stuff that Watson heard was most likely lightning activity, like the the electrical storms that uh, uh, radio uh, coming up from um, Brazil that Marconi might have heard. Um, yeah, and anyway, the, these, um, but, and there's also auroras were listened to while, while being viewed, listened to in the telephone while, while being viewed in, you know, 1870, 1878. The lines of the telegraph system covered a very large surface, uh, not coincidentally along the lines of the British Empire, a familiar unnatural phenomenon at Earth magnitude. The lines functioned simultaneously in two ways, what would now be called a distributed sensing array and telemetry. In other words, uh, telecommunication systems were Earth-scale scientific instruments. And the, these th uh, the, inv the investigation of magnetic storms on the telegraph lines and then, then in the telephone was, uh, they were very, they were coordinated investigations in there, and they were very large. This relates to a claim in Earth Sound, Earth Signal, that so-called communications technologies were not solely about communication, they also involved scientific observations. Moreover, they involved aesthetic engagements that would eventually move into artistic and musical practices and underscored aesthetic dimensions within scientific practice itself. A lot of this natural radio was uh, talked about in terms of musical atmospherics. Um, in fact, music was, even before sort of harder core science, uh, was equated with these, uh, the sounds of these, uh, uh, of natural radio. In the, that, that was even in the late 19th century. With no one sensing, um, so, so with no one sending, these were communes in the f sphere of communications. In terms of historical media theory, this is the liveness of te telecommunications rather than the storage media of gramophones, films, typewriters. So this is, this is sort of a transmissional, um, whole, whole transmissional uh, history that um, just is not within the sort of Kittler, uh, Kit, uh, Friedrich Kittler's um, attention to uh, inscriptive uh, inscription storage media. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> it belongs to transmission and movements of propagation rather than inscription. It gets into a responsiveness of energy politics rather than. Uh, aligning to a deep-time archival impulse of fossilized fuels. 
So in, instead of having this sort of geological trope of deep, deep time or, or um, within rocks, a geologic, I'm, I'm really glad this conference is named that. It gives, gives some latitude uh, to that. The geologic can be restructured along energetic lines that would avoid some of the pitfalls of a, a, adopting geology as a master trope. I think we need to remember that a deracinated version of geology excludes the actual role played by geologists in oil exploration, fracking, and coal mining, which are accelerating the present catastrophe. This class, as far as I'm concerned, this, those geologists should just stop digging holes, seal, <laughs> seal the ones up that they dug, and keep, keep it underground. If we want an optic on fossil fuels, then a cycling of the sun, a sort of heliologic, a cycling of the sun would work just as well. The sun is an energetic orb and can serve as a good register. No problem of global warming there. Uh, weather can still be weather without defaulting to climate. And an old school wilderness still exists throughout the entire heliosphere, uh, except for here. back down to Earth uh, in degrees of uh, uh, both proportionate, in terms of pr 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 ah, proportionality and temperature, in degrees of Earth magnitude, what Hiroshima and global warming, uh, or as I like to call it, Weltmelt, uh, have in common, according to Michel Serre, is that they bring with them a global self-awareness of tangible self-annihilation. I think this is important. He talks about a lot of sort of uh, earth scale things, but he, he says it, it begins with uh, Hiroshima. And just, just like what Mark was saying, and this, I, I think this is an issue here. Uh, he says that the, uh, what they both have in common is a global self-awareness of tangible self-annihilation. So that's like the marker is uh, species extinction, our own and others. I would emphasize a commonality of those two, of uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and other atomic and nuclear weapons. I would emphasize a common, a commonality of both, of both in energies, the former a searing blast bringing the power of the sun down to earth, as I discuss in the book, and also in the uh, geological imagination in the, the reverse Icarus, I, I mentioned it as well. Um, it, brings the, it was thought of as bringing the sun down to earth. Uh, so the, um, well, the, a searing blast of bringing the power of the sun down to earth and the latter, global warming, a slow burn from raising old sun uh, from underground. So when I say old sun, it's sort of fossil, fossil fuels, the photosynthesis trap, photosynthesis. Uh, the historical proximity speaks of a spasmodic, the global warming, uh, the, the 1945 and the, the certification of the Great Acceleration, or, um, for instance, uh, puts them at, at uh, really close to, um, their historical proximity speaks of a spasmodic expenditure, a shock and awe energy war that continues to mobilize its destruction one that is setting the sun on the species along with many others. Uh, thus there is a heliologic in the, in the geologic. The <clears throat> solar terrestrial environment is the job site of, for global warming. You could call it the coal face, if, but I'm afraid that's a um, sort of a British and Australian colloquialism. Um, but for, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to switch it, get out of the sun and go to get out solar light and get into uh, terrestrial light, spe specifically lightning, and see how that operates at Earth magnitude and how it relates to non-light, non-light forms of energy. I will also visit an old friend who has been quiet of late, uh, Andre Breton. I wasn't expecting for him to ever come back, but he has. Um, I just finished a long essay where lightning was used as a method to understand the work of the artist David Haynes and Joyce Hinterding, who uh, many of you uh, know here. 
uh, Josephine Bozma wrote, did a wonderful interview in 1999 with Joyce Hinterding. Um, um, they have a retrospective, a large retrospective in June at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. We're running a parallel conference called Energies in the Arts, where we hope to push a number of theoretical and method methodological issues around the specification of energies. Who knows, we may emerge with an energy-oriented oriented ontology or perhaps ontogeny, maturation rather than a state, as you know, the difference between cosmology and cosmogony. Uh, Haynes and Hinterding's work provides a wonderful opportunity to examine energies across a, a broad band of them, since it's typified by sensory, material, and speculative conversions across an artic articul articulated sweep. Um, when there were genres of art, I guess we're post-media, post-genre, you know, but when there were, the ones ascribed directly to energies, kinetic art, light, light art, and sound art, were satisfied with a narrow band focus or tuning. Um, Whereas uh, this is sort of a broader, broader ban uh, consideration. I don't have time here to tend to specific works. Uh, uh, this essay that I wrote is almost 9,000 words and does work this through the, their specific works, which are uh, quite, quite remarkable. I can only uh, indicate for the rest of the paper a few of the means. Uh, from such means, we can test uh, whenever light is invoked to ask what other energies may be present. How do they look, sound, feel, and smell? Uh, how do they work? Work being one of the base definitions of energy. Where are they from and where do they go? Movement, one of the base definitions of energy at which spatial and temporal scales, uh, transformation and location, one of the base registrations of energy, to what effects and how might this complex, trans, uh, compl might this complex transform notional concepts and experiences and develop others. All this will be information to free, uh, to free energy from its subservience to uh, information where it got stuck uh, a little while back. Uh, New Year's Eve in Sydney, you may be familiar with the fireworks display around the uh, bridge, is uh, uh, there's celebrations of hundred, hundreds of thousands gather in the dark to watch choreographed displays of energy, uh, light, uh, light thundering sound, the feel of shock waves and the smell of explosives. Uh, in the Blue Mountains, in just outside Sydney, where Haynes and Hinterding have lived and where I now live, there, there are similar, similar spectacular displays in the form of electrical storms. It is only because they are unscheduled that huge crowds don't gather. <clears throat> One night last spring, several storm cells converged and several New Year's Eves were simultaneously triggered. Lightning was so plentiful that the night turned into an electrical day. What patches of night remained were reduced to mere flashes of black. The sun usually determines what is day and night, but uh, here terrestrial light uh, oscillated uh, between what was uh, fact and fiction. It was uh, so irreal, I understood why Andre Breton would want to import it. In fact, the image of lightning-filled night could not be more central to Breton's 1924 manifesto of surrealism. He imports this dramatic environmental event to describe how dreaming and the unconscious are wellsprings for poetics structured by electricity. Poetic images, he says, uh, following Pierre Reverdy, are not generated by comparisons, but, quote, from a juxtaposition of two or more, less, more or less distant realities. The more relationship between the two juxtaposed realities is distant and true, the stronger the image will be, the greater its emotional power and poetic uh, reality. 
Now, he, he talks about this explicitly in terms of uh, sort of a, a, the electrics of poetic structure. He said, <clears throat> uh, so think of a distance, this distance is a gap, and the relationship that is formed across the gap uh, as a spark. If the gap is small, like in these Van de Graaff generators, for instance, if you have the one close to the things, that there'll be a, a steady stream of unremarkable sparks. But if you pull the, the ground out further, um, uh, the, the, it'll, there'll be fewer sparks, but they'll be bigger. And then there's a point at which it's too far and nothing, nothing will happen. So Breton celebrated the spot just before the distance of the spark gap becomes too great. This is where a self-illuminating poetics is the most powerful, quote, from the fortuitous juxtaposition of the two terms that a particular light, that uh, a particular light has drawn, the light of the image to which we are infinitely sensitive. The value of the image depends upon the beauty of the spark obtained. It is consequently a function of the difference of potential between the two conductors. So like I said, there's, uh, I take time and he, he gets actually more electrical than that. So for Breton, where day and night roll into one another, uh, the waking and dreaming, um, the domains of solar and terrestrial light, where waking and dreaming, consciousness and unconscious, the unconscious uh, coincide, is a place capable of generating the po poetic light of what he says, a dizzying race of images. And quote, this is the most beautiful night of all, the lightning filled night, day compared to it is night, unquote. So I really don't mind the idea of importing environments all the way into dreaming and the unconscious, whatever, whatever the unconscious might be. Uh, I don't know what all the way might mean either in the terms of movement and registered locations, but what this importation of environments would pr provide now is not only a dose of angst about the importing the degenerative state of environments into our innermost being, but, uh, but also, um, uh, yeah, and, uh, it would no longer sort of fill up the fill up the soul like it used to, but it would also provide relief from the constant shipments of microchips and computer architecture that uh, are usually imported in notions of, you know, the brain and AI and uh, different cognitive science. Uh, a more complete importation of lightning would include the distance it creates in the delay of thunder, or as the thunder echoes and rolls over the landscape in different directions, uh, gathering up artifacts in space in, in what I call uh, in the book Transperception. Or the crack of deafening space that rips, rips open, uh, that rips open the space uh, when it strikes too closely. So, but sound is, is but one energy among others. That's, that's one of my mottos now, by the way. Uh, in this case, you were hearing the shock wave caused by superheated air, that is, your hearing searing. Uh, light, too, is but one energy among others. There is no delay from light to the sound of lightning in the static of an AM radio because the full spectrum burst contains radio of lightning, contains radio waves that are also aspire to the speed of light. The program of static, and this is something I do now that I live, live in the mountains, I have an AM radio, and and it's, you know, the programming is so crap, you know, it's, it's much better just to listen, you know, when a storm comes and just, uh, yeah, I have it on and, you know, you know, um, and you can listen to it, you know, after it's uh, gone, you know, many uh, kilometers away. But like I said, it's preferable to the regularly scheduled programming. Um, yeah, the program of static continues as the storm travels many kilometers out of sight. As with the early days of telecommunications, a means of, a means of communications uh, functions also as a means of commune. The radio admitted will also travel hundreds of kilometers uh, ricocheting between the Earth and ionosphere. 
uh, if the conditions are right, it will hitch a ride on a magneto-ionic flux line that, that takes it out to outer space, six, six Earth radii into, into space in the magnetosphere, and then back again to the, where it's heard in the opposite hemisphere. I, I, I introduced all oh, that's in the book. Uh, so the, uh, and when it comes, it sort of gets teased, instead of this packet of noise, it gets teased out into these uh, sliding tones, and the most beautiful is uh, called a whistler, and for, it's for good reason. Um, so storms in Sydney, electrical storm in Sydney, might transmit, uh, would transmit toward the neighborhood of Nagoya, her sister city in Japan, and vice versa. So geopolitical sisters become geophysical sisters that whistle to one another. I think there should be a whole system of, they're, they're actually called uh, conjugate points, these uh, places where, in, uh, no, traveling north and south, where I think the, you know, instead of having sister cities, there should be these conjugate, yeah, uh, these conjugate points uh, as, as a form of communication, storm communication. So these whistlers are a form of natural radio. We don't have to rehearse the absence of, in nature, natural, we don't have to rehearse the absence of pristine nature. Lightning is now an admixture of terrestrial light with uh, old solar light. Fossil fuel expenditure and a revengist uh, live sun has intensified and relocated weather patterns and thus the incidence of lightning and the radio it produces. Solar activity has always influenced terrestrial light, as in biomass and fire and moonlight and electrical generation, but now, now um, each lightning strike has a bit of human in it. Now seeing lightning in high voltage, hearing its acoustical and electric magnetic manifestations extends in the work of Haynes and Hinterding to smelling. Uh, Haynes' attention to smells and through his uh, interest in Luca Turin's vibrational theory of olfaction. Um, so it, that for the sort of this vibrational theory for him brings smells in, into frequencies, into a world of frequencies and, and tunings. Um, lightning has the smell of ozone uh, of 200,000 to a million volts fusing a third oxygen atom onto what we breathe. Uh, it derives its name from the Greek word for to smell. Some track it to the Hebrew for breath of God, which would mean God not only has bad breath, but it is so bad as to be toxic. Now this, this is the real reason he rarely speaks to people, let's say, figure that out. Um, if you have almost been struck by lightning, you will have smelt his deathly breath. It uh, had happened to me once in, um, in Seattle. Um, it just must have been a few meters from me. I, uh, all of a sudden, it, uh, I smelt, I thought it was my, my hair burning, but then I knew I didn't have, but, uh, <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, but it was, but it wasn't, it, you know, I thought it, my uh, eyebrows and eyelashes uh, were being singed, but it, it wasn't, it was the smell, smell of ozone. Um, yeah, those who have actually been struck uh, may bear a uh, feathered, they might, might not live to tell about it, but they may uh, bear a feathered dendritic pattern of capillaries emblazoned upon the skin that is called a lightning flower. The perfume of this flower is a blend of ozone and burning blood. When people feel a storm front with rain approaching, it is aided by the smell of ozone created electrically in the heights of a distant thunderstorm that is then drafted down and blown in front of the storm many kilometers ahead. If the rain that follows hits dry earth, then another distinct smell comes into play. In the 1960s, two mineral chemists in Australia called this petrichor, from petros meaning stone, and ichor referring to, quote, the ethereal fluid that flowed like blood in the veins of the gods. Don't, don't tell me scientists don't have aesthetics. 
Um, uh, yeah, so the, uh, the, uh, the ethereal fluid that flowed like blood in the vein of the gods, or in a uh, more reserved version, a tenuous essence. Uh, this smell, too, travels on the, the wind. Uh, there was a range of speculation, in fact, at that time, and uh, maybe Mark can tell me if it's still, uh, <clears throat> if it's still viable, that, the, that part of it uh, had to do with the uh, rain seeding something that would then flow down to rivers and almost sort of catalyze the creation of petroleum. I'll, uh, maybe we can talk uh, later about this. I, I, uh, I just saw it in, in, their, in their papers. So the use, the use of perfumes in this way can be tracked to, back to India where the aroma released from dried clay pottery was trapped in sandalwood oil to make what was called earth perfume, a word that derived, uh, well, when, whereas contemporary uh, perfumers rely on a different process involving the molecule geosmin uh, a word that derives from the Greek for smell and geo, the earth. A ge so there's a geologic for the, for the nose, and if these two are draft, uh, being drafted on the wind, there's a certain, I'm not sure if it gets up to over the horizon, but there's a certain spatiality uh, to, uh, to, the <clears throat> uh, uh, to them. This production is based on the complex chemistry of a bacterium found in the soil that is volatile, volatilized when dampened or exposed. So the existence, I'm getting very close here, the existence of ozone higher in the heavens has a special meaning for Australians, among others, since the hole in the ozone layer allows ultraviolet light from the sun through, wreaking damage on living organisms and increasing the incidence of skin cancer in humans. Uh, ozone's absence, absence once smelled like hairspray and shaving cream. So slowing down the um, depletion rate of ozone has been used to indicate the hopeful possibility of avoiding disastrous global warming, but their cosmetic gases and aerosols have pr proven much easier to curtail than car exhaust, coal fire, plant emissions, or belching cattle. Ozone wafts on the winds of memory as well, um, especially where there are electrostatics, um, the manufacturers of uh, office copying machines, for instance, publish glossy brochures to tell, tell people not to worry about the ozone being produced. Or high voltage, uh, uh, a lot of people smell it from a third rail in a subway. For many, for many people, uh, ozone equates with the, generally with the smell of electricity. Now I'll, I'll, I'll finish uh, by wondering now that the now that the increasing heat of the sun sets on 24/7 Jonathan Crary's 24/7 uh, uh, electrical days. The, these uh, so you have a kind of 24/7 is this inversion of the solar terrestrial in terms of light and other, other things. What politics are dreamt when energetic environments are imported in their sensory material and speculative uh, complexity? What happens when the spark obtained in Breton's um, poetic structure smells of ozone and can be heard in the opposite hemisphere? It's, it seems to me that, it seems clear that our fate is, is with uh, uh, energy politics and what must happen politically more generally for that to be possible. But so what then are the poetics, aesthetics, the quotidian of larger energetics at, uh, at geo and at the geo and the heliologic? Thank you. <laughs>